So I'm standing beautiful in the light. We turned down the lights a little bit. We had this beautiful countdown starting here now. Welcome, everybody. Like, I'm delighted to see that we are so many people in there. It's fantastic. I didn't expect so many people. I hope the people that are still standing will find some uncomfortable place to still stand. But anyways, <laughs> you guys don't know it yet. But you all are very lucky tonight. I know. Because you're going to witness something fantastic, something new, something beautiful. Because you're all going to witness the birth of Blue Ball. Blue Bob is an initiative that two of my colleagues and I, that we have dreamt up over the last couple of months, actually. Because the three of us, we have a background in science, and we come from the university. And we know there are fantastic people working there. There are fantastic stories, fantastic discoveries that are made there. And often they don't find the way out. So we wanted to bring that science out of the university. And we want to bring it to the people. And we post that idea to the Center of Protein Research here at the Copenhagen University. And they looked at us and said, like, yeah, that's a great idea. Please, please do this. And they agreed to fund us. So we're very grateful that they agreed to this, because otherwise we wouldn't be standing here. And so we thought, like, if we want to bring science out to people, to the public, well, we start easy, right? And where are people in Copenhagen normally after 5 or 6 o'clock? Well, they are the bar as clearly indicated here, right? So we asked sort of Fierkent, hey, we have this cool idea, we want to tell something, we want to tell stories, we want to bring scientists on the stage, we want to bring artists on stage, can we do it at your place? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And so we're here tonight, so we're also grateful to them that we can be here tonight and that they offered their stage to us. And then also from my experience, like it's always good that when you want to be inspired, you want to hear something, it's always a great idea to be well lubricated, rehydration is important, so I hope you all are settled with a drink. Otherwise, please take the time still to get a drink before we really get started here. One important announcement is we are also filming in here. Like, we have a fixed camera up there and we have somewhere our video expert running around taking pictures. If anybody's uncomfortable with this one, please let us know. But we will not have close-ups. That's more like that we can put stuff up there. How beautiful and what for a great time we're having here. So it's not enough to only get you in here and to come in the bar. It would be a shame if we are presenting something here and in two hours I'm standing here all by myself on the stage. That would be a bit of a shame, so I hope that's not happening. <laughs> so I thought like we need to present something that's actually interesting because I think all of us somehow know this feeling, watching signs, listen to it, and it's really boring and it's really not engaging. So we actually work together with some young scientists and say so like, hey, we don't only want to so show your science, we want to show who you are, why you're passionate about this one. We want them to take us in, in one small area of their work and say like, hey, look, that's what I'm doing, it's really cool. And hopefully they're gonna show it in a way that is engaging, inspiring, interacting. Some of the first presenters also already told me like, she will somehow engage you. So some people of you got these beats and have been told there's something in there. But then we thought like, well, just science, that's maybe a bit heavy. So we thought we do not just science. We have more than that. Because we also were able to get an artist along and he will refer to the same topic in a completely different way. And hopefully he will be able to give us a new perspective on how things are connected. So the science presentations that we're hearing, there will be roughly 15 minutes where we give the scientists a chance to show what they are doing. And then I also have like Eleonora with me, who's sitting over there. She's the one that came up with our blue, beautiful blue bulb, our logo. So she definitely knows how to handle a pen, like she knows how this works. And so she's going to be sitting there with, ready with her iPad and actually illustrate a little bit what she's hearing tonight. And then every after, after every presentation, we're going to have a small look at what she's coming up with. And we'll see if what she got out of this, what our presenter wanted to present, and what you got out of this, if this is somehow aligned or if we are somewhere diverging wildly. We also sent Eleonora to meet our presenters on their workplaces because we want to know where, what are they doing when they're not on stage? Because here we only get a small glimpse. So some of them are work laboratories, some of them work actually at the beach. And we want to know what are you doing there? How are you doing there? 
So now that we all know that what we're seeing tonight, let's start a little bit with the topic. And tonight we have the topic of structures. And you see three things standing on that table, on that bar stool, and on that table. And they seem a bit quar quite far off. But we want to figure out what is a structure. And the structure, well, it's just a collection of elements that can somehow be assembled into something larger, something more complex. And tonight we have a biochemist, we have a sculptor, a sculptor, and we have an architect, and they all will take a turn on looking how is this element of structure included in their work. But one thing after the other, we start with the biochemistry, and we have a fantastic speaker, Claudia. Let's meet her now first in the lab in a small two or three minute video, and after that on stage. Thank you, everybody. Ciao, today we are here at the canteen in the Mars Tower to show you that protein are just more, mu much more than just like beans and meat. We are here at the Novo Nordis Foundation, the Center of Protein Research, CPR, where they do a lot of cool stuff with protein, and specifically we are going to meet Claudia. She's working on how proteins look like. Let's figure it out. Claudia, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm fine. What are you doing? I'm just preparing some tubes that I'm going to need later. Okay, are you a little bit busy today? Um, no. I can, no? I can so I this. think we're gonna talk a little bit about protein, right? Yeah, absolutely. Do you need this? Um, I, I might eat this for dinner, but I'm not gonna work with it for that, no. Okay, so are you gonna tell us what you're working on? Yes, I'd like to do that. That'd be great. to talk a bit more about Claudia and who is Claudia. So where do you, did you get the idea to be a researcher? Um, so I guess it comes from school where I really liked when we talked in biology more about the chemistry and in chemistry more about biology and then I realized I could study something that's called biochemistry and that was exactly what I wanted so, to study. Like how old were you when you decided? Um, maybe 17 or 18. Okay. Yeah. okay. And I really like being in the lab and it's, it can be really exciting to look at something that no one else has looked at before. And if you get so good is results, this one of the excited part of your job? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you get a good result and you know, okay, this is something that we have not know, you know, seen before, that's really exciting. And what about the stress, the, the things that stress you most in this job? Um, there is not the result there, <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, exactly. If you don't get results or if the results don't really make sense, then it can be a bit stressful. So usually what you end up doing is you just repeat the result, the, the experiment over and over again and hopefully at one stage you... How many times did you repeat the uh, experiment? <laughs> <laughs> it happens, you have to do them four or five times. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> but excitement there, I can see that you're so excited about this job and what you're doing. Yeah. And um, like what are you talking about tonight? Like. Um, so I'm going to talk about protein structures, um, okay. not about the bean protein, but um, particular one example that I find really cool. That's super nice and amazing. I'm looking forward to hear that. And uh, let's, see to, let's see you tonight. Good evening. I'm really glad we fucked up the tone already because that means now, if, even if I fuck up, it wasn't the first fuck up tonight. <laughs> so that's good. Let me start by asking you a question. I promise it's a really easy one. Do you ever think about what makes your heart beat? Or how come that your blood somehow transports oxygen around your body? Or how it comes that your brain can fire electric signals? If you don't, that's perfectly normal. Um, it's actually probably me who's a little bit weird because I do think about these things every now and then. And um, tonight I want to tell you a little bit about these um, things because behind me you can see the image of a DNA strand. You've probably seen that before. And you probably also heard at some stage that DNA is the blueprint of life and all the information is stored there. And it's absolutely right and it's maybe also a little bit cool. 
but um, it's actually the proteins that do all the work in our body. So it's the proteins that transport the oxygen that's, that makes your brain fire electric signals. And in some ways, it's a little bit like the office where the DNA thinks it's the greatest and bestest, but actually doesn't get any of the work done. <laughs> no, it's all the proteins that do all the work in our body, and that makes them so much more interesting to me. And sometimes it can also be really beautiful, and I hope I can show you today why that is. So let's dive right in. What, what is a protein actually? What does it look like? And um, proteins are made out of amino acids. There's 21 different ones that we find in proteins, and they have different chemical properties and things. But for tonight, let's think of them as little beads that have a different color. And I was hoping you can help me with explaining that, um, because it's a lot more intuitive when you actually get to do it yourself. So on your tables, you find little props prepared, the beads um, that Sebastian was already mentioning. So I'd like, you to, I, I'd like to invite you um, to make your own protein today. So you have little amino acid beads, and you have a little manual that goes with it. So it's a little bit like in the cell, where you have a manual in the form of DNA and RNA and then you get to make proteins. You can do it alone, you can share with the neighboring table that might not have any amino acid beads, or you can go and get another drink. That's up to you, but you can now make your own protein. Can I get my glass of water? Thank you. Okay, you can keep making your proteins. I just wanted to tell you that you are basically now doing the job of the ribosomes. So in our cells, it's the ribosomes that make the proteins. And they also have a little manual and they put one amino acid after another onto a string making a protein. And the sequence of the amino acids, so which amino acid comes after which, is, called, is what we call primary structure. Primary, it's the first, it's also the most important one. And so now you're basically little ribosomes producing proteins. I'm going to give you a little bit more time to finish your protein. I can see some are still working, so I'll give you a bit more time to get it done. <laughs> okay, I think st things are starting to look really good. I can see some nice proteins being made here. <laughs> so, now that you're done with your primary structure, let's go up a level. Because each protein will then each protein will then get another level of structure, which is called the secondary structure. 
So depending on which primary structure your protein has, it will form different types of secondary structure. We have two different types. The first one is beta sheets, and you can think of them a little bit like train tracks. So the protein will go up a track, will loop around and go down the track as well. And then you sort of have parallel train tracks. That's the first one. The other one is called an alpha helix. And it's a little bit like this slinky here. I knew it would be a little bit hard to handle this. <laughs> but basically what amino acids do, um, they form these little spirals here. And um, again, it will depend on the primary structure, which secondary structure we get. So the table over here made protein A, and that will have a different secondary structure compared to protein B that this table made over here. Okay. We have another level, you may have guessed it, it's a tertiary structure. So now it's when things get a bit complicated because I would need probably three hands to do this. But what happens now is that we take the secondary structures that we made and we combine them and we sort of twist and turn them in 3D a little bit like this. I was also hoping that some of you could maybe get a slinky, maybe Sebastian you can uh, turn out a few. You're allowed to destroy a slinky, isn't that fantastic? Yeah, we, were, we haven't, actually haven't tried this, so I'm, yeah, it, it gets a little bit weird if you try this with the slinkies. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you should have cut them in half, maybe. That's much more fun. Great. Okay. Nope. Yeah, this is very hard. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get your attention again while still having fun with the slinkies because basically combining different secondary structures is exactly what human or what nature does and it comes up with some really crazy structures and a couple of um, them I show here. So the variety that we get is huge. You get really small ones that are sort of round, you get long, yeah, stringy ones, sometimes you get some with three different arms. And in many cases, now that we have these three levels of structures, we have fully functional proteins. So these proteins can now go out and do whatever job they have. But in some cases, there is more. So some proteins have a quaternary structure. And this is when different or a couple of um, copies either of the same protein or of a different protein come together and form a protein complex. So if I, um, you sort of have a, a tertiary structure of a well, protein here? Yet, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll still do it. So basically two proteins just come together and if you sort of hold it like this and then maybe they, yeah, they, they sort of stick with each other, that's when we get a quaternary structure of a protein. Nice, thank you very much. We, we've done good with our, our quaternary structure. And I'm glad no slinkies got harmed in the process. So we can do that <laughs> again. That's, that worked well. <laughs> and for the most case, this process of forming of the different structures is actually a spontaneous process. So as soon as a protein is being made by the ribosome, um, the secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures will um, form as the protein is being made. Okay, so now I talked a lot about structures and how it has something to do with function. But maybe some of you are not quite convinced yet that proteins can also be beautiful. But what if I show you this here? This is a protein that we all have in our body and we'll come to the function in a little while. But I might point out um, the secondary structure of that protein, uh, which hopefully you can all see. So the slinkies, the alpha helices that I was talking about, we can find them here in these wings. So these are all the spirals. And then we have a head part up here that has these train tracks, the beta sheets. So, okay, we found the, the secondary structure already. And you can also see that these three wings have slightly different colors. It's because three copies of this protein come together to form a protein complex. So we know this protein has a quaternary structure. 
This protein is called a piezo protein. And it actually, these three wings sit in our cell membranes. They're embedded in our cell membranes. So if you remember biology from a couple of years ago, cell membranes is this fatty layer that surrounds all of our cells. And it's really important because it um, makes the boundary between our cell and whatever surrounds it. So this protein bridges the cell membrane. And it's a bit hard to see in this video, but there is actually an opening in this head. So this protein is an ion channel. And this opening means that it can open and close depending on what surroundings we have and thereby either let ions through and then we might get a signal somewhere or not. Okay, but what does this piezo protein do? And I'm going to demonstrate. It's a really easy experiment. And I would like to ask Sebastian to help me with that. Okay. So please come on stage. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Will I be home? Uh, no, no. So what I'd like you to do is stand in front of me, don't look at me, and I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder at some stage. Yes. And hopefully you're not going to see it, my hand. Um, and I'd like you to tell us when I put my hand on your shoulder and how you detected, how you knew that my hand was on your shoulder. Okay. Okay. Experiment starts. Hey, there's a hand. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Experiment was successful. Yay! <laughs> I could do that. How did you know that I put my hand on your shoulder? Well, there's some kind of pressure or something. Yeah, right? like, yeah. You yeah. felt my hand touching your shoulder? Yes. Nice. Thank you very much, Sebastian. This works worked beautifully. Yes, thank you. You can have a drink again. <laughs> this is because the piezo protein is embedded in our cell membrane and it pre senses pressure. So in the skin of Sebastian's shoulder, there's a couple of um, copies of this protein and what it does when there's pressure um, these wings get deformed so when I put my hand on Sebastian's shoulder these wings went from a, a curved uh, formation down to a flattened conformation and we're still not entirely sure how exactly it works but this downward motion makes the ion channel open up and that means we have an ion flux through the protein into the cell which means we have an electric signal in the cell, which means that neurons can yeah, transport that signal of my hand on Sebastian's shoulder into his brain and say, ah, Claudia just put her hand on my shoulder. So this is the function of this protein. And um, basically, this is how um, structure supports function. Because if we were to go to the lab and modify the primary structure of the piezo protein, so say, change a couple of amino acids here and there in the right places, what would happen is the secondary structure would change. That would mean that the tertiary structure would change. And even maybe the quaternary structure, so those three wings couldn't come together. They couldn't form an ion channel. And we would lose this pressure sensing function entirely. So next time someone tries to get your attention by putting their hand on your shoulder, you can think of the piezo protein. You can, if you want to, keep your little protein chain as a reminder of how protein structure supports protein function. Thank you very much. Shouldn't be too much in front. Thank you so much, Claudia, for this presentation. Thank you. Um, I think people still have many beats over. Can you randomly put these beads together and it would still be a protein or are there rules here? Um, it would still be a protein, but it probably wouldn't have much of a function. So you really need to follow the manual that the cell has in the form of DNA and then RNA to make this protein. So there are yeah. some rules? There are some rules, yeah. yeah. Now I jumped already ahead and asked a question. Are there any questions <laughs> in the audience that somebody has for Claudia and how proteins are working, structures? There's one all the way at the back. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering, yes, that's a really good question. So the question was, how, how do we study um, the, the structure of a protein and how do we pick which one we take? Um, the first one is, I could probably talk for an hour about this, which I'm not going to go through. Please don't. So, right yeah. <laughs> Sebastian will call me. Yes. Now, there's a couple of different techniques you can use. Um, usually what you start with is some sort of purified protein from a different source. We usually use bacteria to produce our protein, to purify it. 
And then what we use in the lab specifically is a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. So basically what we do is we put our protein on a little grid, a little support structure. We shove it into a microscope and then block the microscope for a week and collect data. We collect images and um, then with very sophisticated software, uh, we can start to um, reconstruct a three-dimensional volume. So a little bit like this, you see sort of this um, yeah, 3D volume there. And then we can start making models. And this is sort of what you saw with the piezo protein. This is a model of a protein that we then can build. And how do we choose what to work with? It's either what interests us or what our boss is already working on. <laughs> and then you sort of have to go with that. Yeah. Thank you. If there are any, yes, yes, another hand for Claudia, she deserves it. <laughs> Sorry, no, I wanted to flee. <laughs> Claudia will be back on stage at the end after yes. all three presenters are here where we can have a joint discussion and stuff, so there would be more options for that. But before that, we want to look what Eleonora. Yes, I see that, I forgot. Eleonora, if I can ask you to make switch over the screen to what you came up with. Yes. Um, can you tell us something? What what did you see there? So or hear there? Claudia talked a little bit more at the beginning about the heart. I hope you can see. And <laughs> if you Sebastian can move, I can see what I what Sorry. I <laughs> so like, and uh, actually she make a claim that DNA is not the cool part here, but the protein heart. So protein are here in the middle. She talked about the second structure, the third structure, and then she talked a bit about this amazing protein that she uh, is studying, which we learn is a canal in the membrane. And uh, so we made an experiment with Sebastian. <laughs> this is actually Sebastian's shoulder that you can see here. It's not that big, is it? <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> Just yeah, I don't know if the hand is wrong yeah. or, the, uh, <laughs> or the shoulder is wrong, but anyway. <laughs> and also, while you were doing like your protein, like your bracelet, uh, you were feeling a little bit as a ribosome. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually studying more like things from bacteria, but I remember this could be kind of like human ribosome, probably. So do you feel a little bit as a ribosome? <laughs> that, that's and a bad right. Also, <laughs> someone from the public that I didn't see ask a question how to study a protein. And then you can use bacteria sometimes. Great, fantastic, Eleonora. <laughs> There? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a bit self-conscious about my yeah, hand. I was nervous about the hand somehow. <laughs> but I love the bacteria. This is, this is, I mean, this is how I wish they were looking. They're a bit more boring in the lab, but from now on I'll think of a bacteria like that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah. So you all can keep building these kind of things in front of you. Now what we're having here are just some models, right? Because these proteins or these amino acids in the real world, they are tiny. Like we visited her and like these machines that are used for that, they are quite big to see quite tiny things. So they are just like standard models. Our next contributor will, will build sculptures. I will build this out of some material that's actually like really the size it should be. But somehow he's going to use some material that was not intended for this, I've been told. I'm quite curious to see what that's going to be. So he will need some time to set this up because he will build this life for us. And I think or could imagine that you need some time to refill your glasses. <laughs> so we're going to have a 10 minute break. I'll read through stuff new and you please be free to have the bar. Thanks for now. in Svan Holen in Copenhagen to see Thomas, which is doing some interesting stuff, let's say, and let's go to see him. And as you can see here, the weather is the normal weather in Copenhagen. I get ready with my raincoat and let's see how, but indeed, also if there is this weather, there is someone working there, which is doing something interesting. Ciao, Thomas. Ciao. I spot you. What are you doing in this? How did you find me? What are you making? That would be some kind of extremely weird fish grabbing a boat. We finally sit a bit here and uh, with Thomas and his sculpture, his little fish, and we would like to know you a little bit more better, Thomas. So, uh, first of all, is this sculpture? Or still need a little bit of time. 
someone destroys it or if, if the element destroys it or if I destroy it, which will piss me off nearly. Um, until then it's not actually finished. Uh, because yeah, I'm kind of a perfectionist so I'll keep on adding some details. And then it's kind of a gamble because at some points I might dig in a bit too much car too far and then it will collapse and you don't want to be around when that happens. So is this a creative process like if you go too far then maybe you destroy what you have done nicely yes. and then like if indeed you stop before you feel like I should let be quiet. Exactly. So it's pretty much like gambling. Okay. like the idea of communicating more in science um, and even though I would definitely not introduce myself as a professional sculptor um, I like the challenge so I mean if I can bring this conclusion why not and what are you showing us tonight uh, tonight I'm bringing three tons of sand from this beach into the bar okay. and I'm also planning to flood the entire bar and then freeze it so there's gonna be sand sculpture ice sculpting and no actually I'll have to come up with something that is more far than that so okay. we'll improvise with Another material, you'll see. That will be amazing and I'm looking forward to see what actually you are thinking. If there. by amazing you mean surprising, then yes. Yeah, I mean that. So let's see, see you on the stage. Yes, that's my Hello everyone. Um have you noticed the hashtag below the blue bolt stuff? It says, not just science. Um, to make things clear, I'm, I am the not part here. <laughs> All right, so anything I'm going to say, if, if inaccurate or weird, um, that just falls under the, the, the cop-out of, yeah, this is the artistic license. Um, so uh, one of the many things that drew, drew my attention in Claudia's talk is the fact that um, given 21 amino acids, um, we can, we observe, we, we, we enjoy an amazing diversity of complex machinery stuff in our cells everywhere. And I'm, I can't help but uh, think of how, how, how would God design this <laughs> better? Uh, clearly this is suboptimal. So, well, actually, so it, unless you have a bearded imaginary friend in heaven, um, it seems that, as philosopher Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, what was it? Uh, <laughs> life finds a way. Uh, so you've got a terrible material, like, you know, amino acids are just arranged the way they are, like you, you, you played with the, the bits here, and yeah, it kind of works, but also it's not, clearly not optimized. Uh, and yet you do reach some amazing diversity of rather functioning stuff. Um, what would be the artistic or sculpting or whatever equivalent of this? Um, we could have an example here, and since we're in Denmark, I guess you are all familiar with Legos. The thing is, um, I don't know whether you know those, but that's a construction toy called Kapla. Um, these are perfectly optimized for architectural purposes. Um, like, they're perfectly cuboid shaped, they're smooth, they're right angled, the proportions are integer multiples of one another. It's, this is great, and you can easily just um, build nice stuff. Legos are completely optimized for building, so that's actually not a great way to represent the concept of building something amazing out of elements that are suboptimal. So, um, in about 15 minutes tonight, how can I illustrate this process? Um, well, let's just come up with the least optimized material I could think of. Have you ever seen those? Can you guess what is this? Ah, oh, you've been, yeah, you, you, you did great with the slinky so up. You, you get to play with more toys. <laughs> So, what are these? Piano. Yes, these are piano keys, and I think we can all agree here that piano keys are not exactly designed for sculpting. Or maybe I've been doing piano stuff all wrong my whole life. Um, 
yet. Yeah, let's try to make do with those. Because when you first look at these, um, first of all, they're all different, unlike these. Uh, they're kind of flat, but also not flat. They're all bent. Um, the angle of the bending is not the same. In fact, I had to sort them out according to bend, well, bending angle here, orientation of the hook and the indent, um, black and white, of course. Um, and yeah, if, if this is not enough, um, there's lead here and it's not always the same amount of lead, so the balance is just off. It's, that's, this is just horrible. Um, but let's, you know what, let's try to build something out of this anyway. Um, by the way, no matter, no matter how much I like to uh, not abide the gender stereotypes, I'm still terrible at multitasking, so while I'm sculpting and building stuff, I might not be able to ent entertain you with some extremely relevant speech, so feel free to play around with the piano keys and try to build your own towers or whatever. <laughs> so, um, these are three kind of similar, um, similarly bending piano keys, and when playing around with them, uh, I first tried to just pile them up a bit like Kaplan Tower, but I quickly realized that this was just extremely unsatisfying and uh, not satisfying. So instead of complaining about the imperfection of those, let's rather exploit the nice features of these wonderful elements of construction, which are totally not what they're made for, but fine. Um, they are rather stiff, but also very slightly flexible. Uh, the friction on the wood is quite nice. This is extremely smooth, but the friction here is all right. Uh, sharp in dents and these very nice little bits here, which I don't know whether you know any piano manufacturer, but I guess these are meant to hold the hammers. So you press here and then ding. Uh, and well, let's, let's try to make use of those. And actually, if we take three of these, there's a way to interlock them and there we go wow. so the challenge tonight is going to be yeah let's let's build something uh, only using those so we'll just yeah let's play god with amino acids and let's yeah build something that at least is unexpected. Using only those because there's no such thing as amino acid glue or amino acid screws. So the rule of the game uh, for tonight is to only use these. So that's a nice base. And well, you know what you do when you got a decent idea? Well, you just over exploit it. Let's milk the cow because that, that's, this is really satisfying. So I'm, I'm going to make more of those triangles. In fact, these are totally not prepared in advance. <laughs> Said no glue. I feel so much tension in the room, like there's tension in the sculpture, tension will, uh, what will it be, what will it become? <laughs> <laughs> 
nice word for today. <laughs> And there we go. So it seems I've pushed this to some kind of maximum. And already you can see that the intrinsic properties of these piano keys, uh, like the fact that they're slightly bent, uh, emerges in a kind of spiraling pattern here. And I get this amazing shape. So what the hell is that? Um, I guess that could be some kind of medieval weapon or uh, maybe some timber steampunk prop. Um, but even though that looks like it will just crumble or just fall apart as soon as I stop applying pressure with my fingers here, the thing is, the frictions and the fric yeah friction and, uh, the, the interaction between those piano keys, the friction, the tension, and the stif stif the stiffness of them makes it possible to just flip around things and reach stability. So, well, that's a nice basis, and that's going to be our main structure. Um, I would nearly, nearly accept the challenge of sitting on this just to prove a point, but let's not. Um, <laughs> that's our basis, and let's, let's yeah, let the fun begin. Um, we have some skeleton of some sort, so I guess we should be making some kind of creature. How about we add some kind of tail here and also some kind of arms yes there should be arms like here. And also here, as well as in fact, no. Not here. I told you they're all, all different. It's like a symphony, you don't want to play the wrong notes. <laughs> there we go. Tension and tension again, and that one is slightly wider, so we can nicely wedge here. There we go. Does this look like a creature to you? Yeah, you're a very indulgent audience because I think it doesn't yet. Do you know what that cheat code is? Uh, whenever you, if you just carve a stupid potato or, um, you know, like any random object can be turned into a cute little creature using one cheat code. Goggly eyes. If you just, just throw eyes, cute eyes on anything, then yeah, suddenly it's a creature. Um, the thing is, we pledged to only use piano keys. Um, so we'll have to make do with those. Good thing is, we can exploit black keys. Nice choice of playlist. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> All right. Um, these could be eyes, right? Um, so. Let's see if we can squeeze them here. So black keys are narrower. Yeah, that should work, but we need two of them. So 
if I just do this. Yes. Now I barely have enough space to... All right, this is how I blame God for not creating me with a third arm. Uh, can I use an assistant here? Like that one. How much stage? Time? Yes. What should I do? You should hold my piano key I. Sounds here. terrifying. I know. Please hold this. This one, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there we go. Right, um, that looks terrible yet, but if we force this to... Yes, and now all we need is some more friction to hold this. I, uh, thanks, your service are greatly appreciated. Thank you, there's so many beautiful things. And using friction here, we can maybe stabilize the eyes. There we go. And eyes, antennas, or maybe flip that. Mandibles, nose, whatever. Anyway, this is now a creature because it has cute little eyes. <laughs> and I guess we can perhaps complete this with... All right, is this a crab or a bird? So far... I would have thought that would be a bird, but uh, th that's, yeah. Uh, this is more crabby, so you know what, let's, let's just commit into the crabbiness of this. Um, so how do you recognize a crab? Years of practice in sushi restaurants. Close. <laughs> Uh, let's see if we can balance some clothes here. There we go. We now have a crab. I'm not going to commit with a claw on the other side because that's going to fall apart. So let's say this is a hybrid between a crab and some kind of bird. So let's use this. So the other side is just a wing. And that's not working. So there we go. And another feather. <laughs> this is a terribly selected fee feather. There we go. And I'm gonna stop there before everything falls apart. Um, I don't think I don't see any future in this as a massive art, but uh, the point I was trying to make, I hope, is made. And I don't in encourage you to destroy your piano as soon as you come home. But what I do encourage you to experiment is to try to build stuff out of material or elements that are completely not meant for it, because you will find. Um, maybe not satisfaction, but at least uh, entertainment there. Um, also, um, promotion time. Uh, if you're enjoying this event, uh, I strongly encourage you to attend the next Blue Bowl event, because then uh, you will get to experience and enjoy a slightly more 
orthodox use of a piano. <laughs> Right, okay. So we have. Okay. Can I come anywhere near it, or should I keep my? Um, most props are not anti-German, so you, you, you should be fine. I should be fine. Okay, so I come a little bit nearer. Um, are we having some questions for Thomas somehow? Like, yeah, any question from you? Because I certainly do. Yeah, yes. How is sand as a material? Because you were talking about piano, it's not really loose. And you've done the sand sculpture. Were you sad because of like rain in Denmark and stuff? Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Sand is very different. It it's uh, it is just it, sand is doomed to crumble. So there's no commitment. Like you can create something imperfect, it will just crumble down. Okay, and <laughs> I'm gonna answer in a very philosophical way. Everything is a matter of time scale. Uh, cathedrals are amazing, but yeah, given a few centuries, they will also crumble down to the ground. So it's just a reduction of the scale. Um, but otherwise, I take pictures. And <laughs> <laughs> that's a good backup. <laughs> are there any other questions for Thomas? Because otherwise, also Thomas will join us in the end for a talk with all three presenters that we're having tonight. There's something I, mean, I know of sand and snow, and I know piano keys. <laughs> Sculpt anything, and not of any other thing that will surprise people. <laughs> so you're not surprised enough with this. Other <laughs> <laughs> experimentation that perhaps I am. I am up for suggestions. Ah. Brilliant. Human pine. <laughs> Something for tonight, maybe. Let's see. Mm -hmm. The evening gets late. Eleonora, um, it's another visual thing we're seeing. Yeah, I should maybe move yeah. out of the way. Uh, what did you get out of Thomas's um, from part? From Thomas, I understood that we should put ice everywhere because <laughs> <laughs> ice stuff everywhere. So we have uh, now, like Claudia Sands has got um, nice eyes there. So he works with uh, piano keys. So of course, I need a piano. Also because I love love it as an instrument and I also make a sushi roll because it's 9.7.30 I cannot read my, my clock now and uh, he talks a bit about like sushi once he was showing us how it's good with chopstick and I also put very nice eyes I love them on the keyboards you see Aww. and of course there is a crab here at, at least I understood it's a crab right yes. a bird of a crab. part of it is a crab Okay, okay. Then here is a little bit of a crowd. I'm pretty happy. I also put them on the bacteria. They were already there because I love eyes everywhere. That's sweet. Do you see a little bit what you talked about, showed here? Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. I would, like I, I should put some musical notes. Always very depicting. I think we should give Thomas another hand for this beautiful. Yes. Move the so I think that was a beautiful illustration how regular elements, I'm still terrified of touching, uh, regular elements and irregular elements, that when you use them right, like the result is very different, right? And somehow the materials that we're using and the techniques we're using, here we're just putting on top, there we're interlocking them with pressure, actually matters for the outcome, for what we can do with it. And our last speaker tonight, we're going to hear later, she's going to exploit a little bit this idea and show how architecture developed this idea of different materials, different methods. But before she can come on stage, I think we should move this little guy a little bit to the side. Not right now, maybe. No, that's fine. Let's I'm just... I'm nervous when we're touching it in front of everybody again. But you just need to move this one, and you maybe need to have another break, maybe another drink. So in 10 minutes' time, we're going to continue again. Thanks for now. Maybe there.
Ciao a tutti, today I'm here at the Royal Danish Academy near Repislone. I'm here to find how art construction and beauty are intertwined together and they need each other. To do so, I am meeting with Susie, who research is combining the looks of ancient columns with the modern of technique printing, 3D printing. Hello, are you Susie? I am, do you come in? Yes. Okay, that was also another fact there. <laughs> but what do you like more about architecture and how do you like here to study it? Well, I think it's, it's a, there's a really strong research environment and a really strong research culture um, at the school here and particularly in the northern countries that are very supportive of different types of research as we do. So if you have to describe your usual day as an architect, what would you say? In the workshop, like uh, being with the hammer, yes, and, like, yes. not on your computer. No, as yeah, we yeah, no, no, this is uh, definitely in the workshop. So, why did you take part to do that? Uh, well, because I'm really passionate about this research uh, that I've been doing, and I'd really like to communicate it to a good audience. And I think it's a great initiative that you guys Thank have. you. And what did you are going to talk <laughs> to them about? Well, I'm going to talk a bit about these 3D columns that I've been, 3D printed columns that I've been making and been using as experimental research. Design pieces, uh, talk about the, the, the story behind the construction of them, and, and, and show you a little bit about how they look and how they Okay, thanks a lot, Susie, and see you tonight. <laughs> Great. Well, that was a great introduction. I don't have to say anything more about my, myself. Um, so we've had a little bit tonight already about structures, structures at a very much a nanoscale in the body, thinking about proteins. And we've also talked about structures from an artist's or a more artistic per perspective, looking at these structures and kind of tension. And I'm going to talk a little bit about structures uh, for, well, from an architect's perspective or from my perspective as a, as a researcher. And I do research into um, uh, 3D printed clay as an architectural material. So what, what, in, given this new type of technology, what, what, what does this mean for the built environment? How can we reimagine the old traditional material of clay using 3D printing? And this what we can see, I, I, I tend to 3D print columns because they're architectural objects as a way to kind of test this as a one-to-one -one scale idea of what this actually means for the built environment. So this is one of the columns I made. It's actually sitting, this was last year in Glyptotec in the winter garden as a kind of test. Unfortunately, there was a global pandemic, so nobody actually got to see it other than me and the people who were watering the plants. Um, but luckily I did get some, some, some image of it that I can show you tonight. So how I'm going to talk about this, I talk about this through a series of columns and, and what they actually represent uh, in different eras. So the column you see on the far left of the screen, this is a, a drawing of a column from the early 18th century. And what this represents, or well, what it represents to me, is a kind of an idea about the era of the craftsman. So the architect or the designer draws the image of the column on, on the paper, and then the craftsman reinterprets this and carves this using his hands, using tools by the hand. So this represents this, a time in the world where things are built by human beings very much at the scale of the hand. 
And now the image in the middle, this is actually from the Barbican Centre in, in London, built in the middle of the 20th century. And for me, this represents something about industry and this industrial idea of production. So the columns here, they're, they're all the same, essentially. And you get this idea about the factory producing them at a large kind of industrial scale. So there's really this kind of separation between the, the design of something and the making of something that's happening in, other, in another place. In, in when you think about it compared with the other column where it's actually being made by the hand on the actual site itself. And these columns here on the, on the far right of the screen, these are actually made by a research department in, uh, in Zurich a couple of years ago. And for me, these represent uh, very much craftsmanship, but also industrialization, because they're 3D printed in concrete. So you get this kind of sense, you look at them, and you can see they're actually made by a machine. But because they're all individual, and they're all slightly different, there's all this, also this idea of individuality again. So this is going back some, somehow to this idea of the pre-industrial time, where things are made by the craftsmen, and they're all very much individual. Um, so, what, so what I can really say about and when I think about this as an architect, so there's, there's always this kind of relationship between artistic expression but also the function and also what, what's happening in a certain time in terms of production and industrialization. So I work with architectural clay, so, so when I'm thinking about it from a 3D printer's perspective. I also think about the history. So what we're seeing here on the, on the right, this is um, a traditional way of shaping architectural clay and this is a big extruding machine. So essentially you put the, the clay in a big tank and you push it with force um, through this metal die form here. And you can probably recognize this type of object you've seen on buildings around. Some of them are stone but often they're actually made from clay because it's a very kind of, um, it, it's, a, it's quite a simple way to produce something but of course you're constrained by the proportions, you can only control it in two dimensions. And on the other side, this is um, these are uh, 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 the start of molds for sometimes when you see more elaborate clay on buildings. So the craftsmen will actually sculpt the form um, and spend many, many hours making the actual kind of formwork. Then it gets cast in plaster, and then what happens? The clay gets put into the mold, and so you can basically take prints and make lots and lots of them. So again, it's quite efficient because you only have to carve one of them. But the issue is that obviously you only get the same thing again and again and again. So you can see kind of the, the, the benefits, but also the kind of issues with these modes of production. So 3D printing, this is what I'm into. And what's really happening here, it's similar a little bit to the extruding process. So the clay, in this case, is actually concrete, is, is in a big machine, and then it's pumped through the uh, uh, hose coming out of a small nozzle. And the robotic arm or the 3D printer will actually move the, the hose around and deposit the material where, where we've actually asked it to go. So as you can see, that, that there's, you, you're free from the constraints of a mold. I can print 10 different columns using this, and each one of them can be different because I don't have to worry about the dye on the machine or the mold. So essentially, 3D printing clay, this is using an old material, an old traditional material, but, but, but we're able to form it in a new way. So here are some of the columns that I've been printing, and I think that this is, I've actually got an element here for you to have a look at. Um, <clears throat> so what they're, 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 as I said, they're made of clay, and the reason that they're not particularly big, this is actually one of the smaller ones, is because when I'm printing with the clay, it's actually very fluid, so it's not very stable. So when it comes out the, m the machine, um, I can only print up to a certain height where it gets too heavy and too wobbly and it starts to collapse. So in terms of how I actually deal with that, is I actually print them like a kind of giant jigsaw puzzle. So they, they interlock in the, um, in the vertical plane, but they also interlock in the horizontal plane. So they kind of sit on top of each other like this um, in the column. I'm not going to give you this one to pass around because it's, this one's quite precious to me. Um, <laughs> but you can certainly have a look at this one um, because I've got millions of these. <laughs> um, but I think... Looking at the, the two methods of production I just spoke about, you can see with these forms, you couldn't make them with the extruder because, of course, you could get this part because it's all the same and in the same plane, but you couldn't get the detail. Um, and you couldn't make them in a mould because it would be far too complicated. How would you actually mould something like that and, and take it apart? 
Um, <clears throat> so here is actually the 3D printer that I've been working with um, uh, in, in progress. So what I'm actually doing, um, I actually draw the individual lines and repeat them and manipulate them in the computer. And what's kind of curious about this whole thing is it's all just kind of one sausage. It's one stream of material that's coming out that's printing this elaborate form. So I essentially draw a line uh, in the computer and it comes out uh, something like this. So I basically, it's like translating a line into the machine. Now, as an architect or as a designer, I often get a little bit promiscuous in terms of my influences. And as I'm sitting there staring at this machine, watching the sausage coming out, and, and as it's kind of weaving the, the material, I start to think, well, actually, this is something that's quite similar to knitting practice because this, it's a similar scale. And I start to notice that this kind of relationship between this kind of mode of production um, and actually how things are knitted. But then, of course, when you change the scale, if you start to put them in a building, um, they start to not look like knitting patterns, but you can start to see the kind of relationship between the scale of the objects and other, other elements in the space or the site that they're supposed to be. And this comes back to that point about the history of architecture and, and in the history, of course, the craftsman is very much working on the site relating to different things. There's this kind of separation where people are designing things and then they're being built in factories. Somehow, through this digital fabrication, this, this process is coming back together again. <clears throat> so here's, so this is an example of this, so I'm drawing in the computer, I'm actually pr producing the thing in front of me, so there's no factory, it's happening right there, and I'm able to print these pieces and take them back to the site, so suddenly I can actually, these relationships get a lot closer um, um, now, after the industrial period, so a little bit into this kind of more medieval way of actually working and thinking. Now I'm going to take you off on another tangent here, so <clears throat> I've talked about using an old material in a new way, but then I thought about using an old material in an old way, but using the new technology. So this is an idea about using this, these 3D printed clay elements as a kind of skin for structural architectural steel. Now, I don't know if anyone knows anything about steel buildings, but when they started to be built in the USA at the end of the 19th century, so they realized something quite quickly, that if a building catches fire and it's made of steel, it will get to a certain temperature and then it will catastrophically collapse. So if, you, if a brick building catches fire or a timber building catches fire, the collapse is, is slower. But, but obviously when the steel reaches or the iron reaches a certain temperature, boom. So a lot of these buildings you'll see in the US, these kind of skyscrapers, they're actually covered in, in, in architectural clay, architectural terracotta. Um, but this kind of went out of fashion because we, engineers and architects found different ways to protect structural steel. But I'm actually thinking, now hang on a second, we've got this 3D printing technology now. Can we start to reimagine this way of building again? So this is a series of... Um, <clears throat> Uh, a cladding system which is working pretty much on the same principle as this to actually the idea of actually clothing um, a, a, a steel frame building um, <clears throat> And then I've talked, and I've talked about this kind of industry and craft and these relationships coming back together. As I'm sitting there and I'm working with the material as it's coming out of the printer, I'm looking at the way it kind of, that I can actually get pieces to kind of almost stick together, but not quite. So these curving pieces, as I print them, they actually support each other. Each other. You couldn't actually print one of them on its own because it would collapse. But if I get the print plus very close to each other, but not quite, not, not, not intermeshing, I can actually print these forms and then gently crack them apart. And then you get this really nice seal as you lock them together like tiles again on the building. And this is, um, this is the final idea for one of, one of these columns. So as I'm coming to the end of my presentation, I think, what do I, want, what do I want to communicate to you? What do I want to get you to take away and think about? Well, I think, as I've said, that the, the changes in industry, they really affect the, the, the way we express ourselves and the way our buildings, our furniture and our clothes are expressed. So I want you to think about your built environment. Where can you see evidence of changes of technology? Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie, for taking us on this time journey somehow, right? Like old wave, today, maybe the future. Are there any questions for Susie at this moment? Yeah. Directly there. Uh, so the columns interior had this elaborate structure. How, how did that come about? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, actually, because when I started making them, I just made them as rings. Um, and then, you know, I sort of spoke with colleagues and, and architects about them. And they said, well, you, because they don't bear any load, um, what, what are they for? Because, you know, a surface is not that interesting. You know, they have to actually, they would have to be, go onto a structure. So I realized that I had to get them to kind of somehow interlock together. So the, the internal structure just came from actually trying to work out a way um, to, to, that they could actually fit together. So in the, in the first ones, they're much more kind of open. Um, but, in, but in the second ones, the darker ones, that it's much more refined. But then looking at that, if you're thinking about it being in a building, actually you could use these channels for electricity or water or other services. There's lots of potential when you have these kind of pockets within a structure. Fascinating. Any other questions? Yeah, directly there. So very simple question, but maybe a little bit more elaborate. Why columns? <laughs> Um, there's a couple of reasons, because I think, because I'm doing sort of exploratory architecture, not, it's, it's kind of half real and half not real, I need to do a form that's recognisable as a piece of architecture and not a piece of sculpture, because it, then it's something different. And of course then there's other, um, another much more simple answer to that is that the 3D printer likes making these kind of extruded forms. So, <laughs> but if you'll, you'll see a lot of projects like this in the world where, where people are doing bricks and columns. But I like the idea of a column because it has this rich history and this kind of heritage. And you can start to, if you look at these columns against more historic columns, you can start to kind of map the changes and the trajectories. And this story about craft and industrialization starts to appear through the column. I see that. There was maybe one more question. Do you think you can transfer into other materials like ceramics and stuff, or is it limited to only clay? Uh, you, well, the, the machine I use, it's pretty much like this. If you can mash it into a paste, you can print it. <laughs> and I've seen chocolate being printed. Uh, obviously, concrete is printed quite a lot. I've seen paper pulp being printed. I've actually put clay and paper into the machine because uh, then you get this kind of aerated clay. So yeah, it's pretty simple. If you can mash it into a paste, you can print it. <laughs> um, I think when there are more questions, again, like also Susie will join us afterwards. Uh, there's more time for questions there. But Eleonora, do you have something for us? Yes, I do. Yes. So let's see what you got out of the column. I would imagine it's a column. So here we start to um, <laughs> the piano, okay, of course, but then of course I have to do a column because, of course, column, right? <laughs> and I also draw a little bit of a coronavirus here because, like, Susie told us that, like, she, there was some problem with coronavirus in the last years for her work too and also like uh, she talked about industrialization and how this process actually makes things all identical so this is why i draw all the square identical <laughs> but then uh, she really likes doing column also because she likes to think about them as sausages right <laughs> so here there is a little bit of sausages that you can see and the sausages, it's like coming from an extruder here that I don't know how to draw it, so I just drew something like that. But I think also it's really nice that she say that, like, uh, she like to uh, do this kind of column that they are like uh, together. They have to be together. So I put a man here holding a column or something like that. She showed us because if things things can fall apart if they are not together. So I think this is pretty interesting. And then taking from some question that we have, we have why columns, because they are nice. I put columns, but I should also write time because she gave a, a nice, very description about like how the time is going and why she likes working with columns. And also here, I this is pretty bad. It should be a chocolate. <laughs> I have to change it, but like someone asked why don't you work also with other material? And I think chocolate would be a very nice material. Great. Susie, any comments to what you're seeing there? Um, Have you I, ever had I, your work interpreted like that? No, particularly the sausage with white columns on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite bit. <laughs> but I think, I think it's uh, Eleanor has captured the, the, the whole thing. Yeah. Beautiful. I put some ice here. Of course, this I was just about to say, like, you didn't put ice no, on anything. I put so it's it not... and I can't <laughs> <that>. no, Maybe <laughs> later. I think we should give a hand to Susie.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard we very different takes on what structures are. And we learned somehow, yeah, well, the small differences, they matter because when these parts in our body are not really working, we might have a complete different protein, which then is not really doing what it's supposed to do. Then we had a reinterpretation of piano keys, and we learned somehow, well, with these set of piano keys and these angles that they are having, it will come somehow to this particular structure. So there are also these small differences matter. And then in the end, we could get a look how different materials, how different techniques that we have available actually create what the end result is. So though these three things are from complete different perspectives, complete different classes, I find it fascinating how many parallel things we can explore there. And I definitely want to dig a little bit deeper into these parallels, and that's why we have this talk a little, in a little bit where all three of them come together here, and then either answer your questions or maybe we have some other cool ideas, philosophical questions or something that come out of this. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. We have this discussion planned, but we need to reset a little bit here. And again, like we got so many input for our brains, maybe we are running down on sugar or, or some other substances that we want to put in our body in the bar. So please feel free, go to the bar again, have a drink, and in 10 minutes we're going to be all together here. When the three of four of us are sitting here, then you know we're about to start. Thank you. You can eat. I know, I know. It's fantastic to see how much, such a little bell, how much right. power it really exerts. Because I can get everybody to be quiet. I like. It. So I see there's a lot of discussion still going, but maybe we invite our experts here, our presenters from tonight, on that one. However, before we take your question, I have one question that I want to pose to all three of you. And this is how important is aesthetics in your line of work? And I would like to start with you, Claudia, because you're a very technical person. This one is aesthetic relevant for you? I think biochemists are very, they're very forgiving, even if we show ugly structures, they're like, oh, but this is this amino acid that makes contact with this, and this is really interesting, even though it doesn't look very nice. Um, but then when you have been to a presentation where a person has really nice videos that sort of something moves, and then you're like, oh man, I wish I could do that. So aesthetics are important, but you can also do with that, which maybe is nice. <laughs> Thomas, what, I mean, you came here as the dedicated artist, the not science person. Is aesthetic relevant in art? Uh, if you just look at me, you can see that aesthetics <laughs> is clearly important for me. Look, look, look at the brave move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess I... Yeah, it's very important. I have to compensate. So yeah, <laughs> yes, it's important. So you're compensating with your art pieces for something? High scores, I suppose. <laughs> and Susie, so you are here the prime example of like how science and how arts are somehow intermingled. Where is aesthetic and functionality on your scale? Yeah, this is the, this is a good one because it's it's such a dirty word. In my <laughs> Because it's so loaded, because there's so much written about this thing. Aesthetics is. Yeah, so in my, in my research, I can't say the word aesthetics because other researchers or theoreticians will say, you can't say that, whose definition of aesthetics are you using? So we talk, we talk about formal language. Uh -huh. So we, we just, I talk about it in the sense of what is the, what are the characteristics of the form that I'm working with? Um, so so I, I, I dodge it, even though it's so important to me. I completely dodge it as You're a, not allowed to call it. To call it. Mm -hmm. I made a mistake when I was visiting her in her workplace. We call like, yeah, but can you have some a picture of something like one of these really ugly buildings? You know, well, there are no ugly buildings. <laughs> yeah, but what well, is ugly? Well, this <laughs> ugly a little bit. She wasn't that dramatic. Define, okay, can I say something? Yes. I made a mistake when I met Susie because I was wearing black. <laughs> And all the dust and the white dust came on my pants, and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna go to work like this. <laughs> so she has a dirty work somehow, right? Um, do we have any questions from you that came out of your small, like you were very engaged in discussion, I could understand, but are there any questions from somebody? Yeah, there's somebody. Hey, uh, through the biochemist person. 
do you think conceptually uh, your field would uh, have perhaps a little bit of a wider appeal in the, in the general populace if there was a larger emphasis on communicating uh, science aesthetically? Yes, I think there would be. And the example I showed you comes from the growth protein database. And they actually have outreach events exactly about that. So they give these models to students in high schools and they see what they come up with and they usually have a gallery at mm -hmm. the end. And mm -hmm. I think that's how we should communicate about protein structures because I can of course talk about, yeah, it's really important because you can do drug design and then you can start treating a disease. But I think what we're sort of getting at is people connect with beautiful things. And this is also, I think, a lot, in a better way of maybe approaching this. So, um, yeah, I wrote about it in my PhD thesis, <laughs> and I, I think there's a lot a lot to be gained by just looking at something and saying, like, this is actually really fascinating, or this is really beautiful. And so I think we should be doing this more now. I could see a follow-up question right there. Uh, I didn't really uh, hear a lot from uh, Ivan because I was shaking my brain. <laughs> 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 uh, but like, uh, I feel like there's something interesting, and uh, like two things that. I came to my mind first, like how much like these kind of uh, methods can be used at schools yeah. and how much can these methods be used as kids? Like, and the, would you think about like same event for kids? Yeah. Like I think we could I think it will Yeah. I think we could totally do that. So the software, for example, to make these little videos, it's accessible to everyone. So depending on the age you could just give the kids a a, a model and then they can play around with it. Um, Sebastian tried to 3D print one of the proteins. It unfortunately, it did, didn't, work. didn't work. Maybe I shouldn't say that. It was because of him. Um, but this would be another. It was because approach. of me. I just want to say it was because of me. <laughs> um, so that you, you you have something to you know have in your hands, and I think that also makes a big difference. No, no, no. The issue is that like I can practically like you live in, you live here in Lebanon, right? Like have you approached like? Yeah. Yeah. Take like one. It's a con lit then, so that's maybe a problem. Oh, okay. But in principle, yeah, totally. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should have a, a chat. <laughs> blue bar kit blue bar kits might be the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I like that. Yes, please. Me? Yes, you. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe kind of like a brief uh, reflection for all of you. Like, I mean, there's a lot of like, okay, we're talking about structures, and then we have somebody who's either doing structuring very creatively or perhaps discovering structures or creating them as well. So kind of what do you see, how do you refer to your own role in this sort of structuring? What is your agency in that? Is it like, because you're obviously all limited by the constraints of your materials and setting, like how, yeah, how do you reflect your own agency in making the structures versus discovering them? I think it's something first for you, like the exploratory architect, what did you call yourself? Mm -hmm. like to find experimental. 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 Maybe start with you. Uh, so I can understand the question, but, but my role in, in, in it, or? Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, because we're kind of talking about structure yeah. as a form. Yeah. And you, for example, you go through this, okay, first you have the craftsmanship that has the clay, and then you make with your hand, then comes the industrialization, and then you're constrained by the form of the machines yeah. or the existing. And then now it's some well, sort of cyborg <laughs> mix of you with the machine. And yeah. I'm not sure if you're, I mean, I mean, kind of how you reflect, are you that for the science? Just like, yeah, like how do you just reflect your own kind of um, agency in that? Yeah, that next to the, I mean, in relation to this structure or form or whatever is it that comes out of it? Yeah, you know, that, that that's a really great question. And it's something that even when I've been working on what I do, that I've come to a bit later on, come to reflect on where I'm actually sitting in this. But then also as the architectural profession, where, where there's, there's always, like, as new technology comes and, and time evolves and everything evolves, the, the, the positioning and the power positioning is something that's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So in, in my research and my PhD, which I'm working on at the moment, this is coming in the kind of later stages where I'm starting to reflect on what does this actually mean? Where are we going? So I don't have the answers <laughs> other than to say that, that, that that's kind of becoming the central and most philosophical point of, of, of what I do. And also realizing that 
that this position is actually relevant not just in the field of architecture, but that in other fields um, as well. Maybe I follow, like, Thomas, do you have something for that question? Because you were looking at me. Mm, not really, because unless you reformulate it so that I have something relevant to say. Maybe I do have something that follows up on this one. That's like, where do you get your inspiration from? Like, maybe that's first to you, but also to your other two. Like, where do you get your inspiration to come up with, like, a new experiment, with a new sculpture, or with a new design? Thomas. Um, <clears throat> inspiration comes from constraint, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, like, you know, like the, the the blank page syndrome is like that's not a myth. It's just it's terrifying. If you have constraints, um, then you start exploring the only possibilities that are accessible to you, and from there you just build element after element, and this is how you get some kind of framework, and that's how you can create. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, oh, I have a good quote for that. Um, Please, from Brazil. Uh, Art is born in constraints, lives of struggle, and dies of liberty. What a beautiful yeah. quote. Um, uh, Claudia, is inspiration playing a, playing a role in your line of work? Um, well, my answer was going to be communication, I think, because as, as scientists, I think we, we talk a lot to our colleagues who sit over there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, a lot of the inspiration we take is um, is coming from talking to others. They have different ideas and they ask you questions like, but but what does this mean, for example? And then you sort of have to rethink all the ideas you had in your head because they say something that makes everything crumble apart. And um, yeah, so I think my, my answer would have been communication there. Yeah, interaction with yeah. others, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Susie, where do you get, do you, where do you need inspiration in your work and where do you find it? I find it inconstrained because like me, the 3D printer, but even though there's lots of possibilities with it, you're also limited by this, this kind of language mm -hmm. that, that, that you can work with. But I also really enjoy exploiting the constraint, the edge of the possibility and really pushing that limit. And I get really excited and inspired by, mm -hmm. by, by exploring it at the edge of what's possible. Yeah. Um, but I think in this discussion, when we're talking scientists and artists and architecture which kind of sits in between science and art. I'm also really interested from the science perspective when you talk about this this kind of impulse where you have this idea which is of course creativity mm -hmm. where you have this idea of I think this is this is I have this hypothesis mm -hmm. and I think actually in science there's not enough focus on those really important points mm -hmm. where somebody has an idea and connects the dots. Yes. Uh, please be free if you have any question along the way, just raise your hand. I will look out for this one. But you are raising a fair point that I also came across. Like, what is the element of science? Because you just put it there, some of the hypothesis. Where do you see the element of science? Like, where do your work, which seems very different, where are the connecting points between this one, Claudia? I mean, if I have to spell it out, then we, we did something wrong tonight because I think all of our presentations sort of. They, they connected in a way of, um, you know, building blocks, pressure, um, columns where different elements come together. So, yeah, I think we're just going to leave it there. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and I like that you all talked about, like, the limitations. The limitations are important to come up with something new. You both, uh, you work with recycled material, which has a complete different intent purpose, and you work with material it's somehow rediscovered, right? Because clay was a little bit dead, maybe not dead, but not really there, and now it's coming again. Um, where's the joy in using material that's intended for different use? Maybe you, Tom, go first, because that's a bit more apparent. Subverting, subverting expectations? What subverting yeah. expectations? Okay. Or the joy. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the slightly perverted joy of hacking objects. As in, the oh, that was the joy, joy of was, hacking <laughs> objects. This was not done for that. <laughs> Screw you, designer. I'm using this for this purpose instead. Uh -huh. So is this in line with what you are saying? Like you like to exploit the limits, the possibilities. Um, I suppose so, but in a but I suppose in a different, in a slightly different. I think there's a kind of. Maybe almost a political 
agenda. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> you <laughs> <have> <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> Can you elaborate on this? What does it mean, like, like uh, an analytical agenda, like? When no, you no, you said political. Political, yeah. Okay. So we talk about sub subversion, and subversion of objects. Yes. Kind of takes the discussion. Into it. Maybe <laughs> I'm completely wrong. Maybe I'll... I don't know. I'm just inserting buzzwords here. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Be free to tweet about Thomas in any kind of way possible. It might give us some reach. Um, I don't know. Do you have any more questions in here? Yes, there's one. I'm just wondering. You're talking about creativity, and if you sit on a very good idea. How do you handle that idea? Is it do you share it with all your colleagues, or do you have to keep it close to uh, to you, like uh, to steal from you? How does it work in your field of work, both in being a designer and architect, and also in, in biochemistry? Do you have to keep it close to your heart, or can you share it with everyone and, and still your own? Awesome? People feel differently about this in my field. I'm of the uh, view that you should share it, because if I share it with a student or my professor or whoever, they're going to come with a different reflection and it's going to take the idea further. So I'm not so interested in owning the idea. I, I want to see the idea expand and I want to see other people work with it. And that's really, really fulfilling. But I know other people have a different attitude to this, but it's not mine. No. For example, owning this, I want to refer to you, like there were some pictures we took of Claudia working and then she said like, oh, you cannot show this because there's a pattern pending on this one. So how's ownership in your field? It's, it's the same but different. So within our group, we also share whatever we have um, very openly. But there is this caveat. If you ever want to spin out a company and get investors to invest money into your company, then you have to be careful because they will often only do that if you have a patent. And that means we, we really can't talk as freely as we most most of us want to. And also in, in science, there is this idea that whoever publishes it first, they get all the credit, even though other people also work with similar ideas. And then is this fear of being being scooped and someone publishing before you exactly what you were working on. So it's a double-edged sword. and. Sometimes it's really hard to navigate because I'm much like Susie. I just want to talk about everything I do because I find it really fascinating and really interesting. And sometimes you have to zip it and say, I can't talk about that, which is sometimes really hard. In case there are some questions that are coming up later, like the three, your three, the three of us are going to be here longer. Feel free to approach us, talk to us, talk at the bar. I think I can say it's on your behalf. You're very approachable tonight for questions, comments, or whatever. So just being said, I want to thank all of you that came here tonight and for staying here tonight. I think most people stayed. I'm quite happy for this, but I'm not talking to myself here. I also owe you to thank you to the three of you, not only for taking the time to be here tonight, for preparing your contributions. And actually, they were the guinea pigs because that's our first event ever. We didn't know how this was going to turn out. We couldn't even explain to them how it's going to turn out. Like basically, the three of us saying, like, yeah, we have this great idea. You want to join? You know, we can do this. So a small thank you for this one. Please take that from us. Because I think you all used a lot of sugar tonight. <laughs> exactly, you all used a lot of sugar. And you should replenish on this one for your brains. I can say that my colleague Moreno, who's back there filming, Eleonora here with me and me, we had a fantastic time organizing this whole event, and we had a good time being here tonight. So uh, also we have to thank again, like for being here, like and thanks to you guys. Um, don't forget to follow us on. We have another slide for this one. Yes. Yes. On Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, like because we are still growing. So please try, or don't try, do it. Uh, yes, I see some people already do it here. Fantastic. We are very happy friendly out there. We need a 101. Yeah, we like exactly. You can be the 100. Now we're 94, 95. So we need, oh, we are 99. So is, we do is there a price for being 100? Uh, you got chocolate already. You can't pay it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> Glory. And if you enjoyed some of that, please tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell your family tell anybody who might be interested in this one because that wasn't our last event we're gonna have another event on the 24th of May so roughly in a month same place same time here at six o'clock and I can tease now a little bit what we're gonna talk about this time or next time okay. because there our big topic gonna to be evolution 
So I know we're going to talk about mutations. We're going to have a musician there that's going to present something. And we even learned something about the Arctic that undergoes a progress. So please feel free to join next month again here at Sort of Vierkant. Um, yes, with this, I'm through with everything. My name is Sebastian. It was a pleasure actually hosting here tonight. Thank you again to you, everybody here on our stage for doing these presentations. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.